Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and on Thursday, June the 27th, at 701 East Georgia Street in Vancouver, Jeff Harris, the lead appellant for 350 plaintiffs in federal court, is having an appeal heard by three judges, <clears throat> 9 o'clock in the morning. So, it's about damages claims for the delays in processing their appeals, and return of the short change time that they knocked off people's permits by backdating them from the date of issue to the date the doctor signed. So, we are appealing to have the time they shortchanged us added to our next permits, and the Crown is cross-appealing to have judges, Judge Brown's decision to let the damages claims go through to see if nine months is too long to wait for meds, and that's coming up on Thursday, June 27. Should be quite a show in Vancouver. These are the two memoranda written by us. The first one, which is the original appeal, asking for the return of the time that they ripped us off. And then the second one is the memorandum in answer to their cross appeal, where they still want to strike out Judge Brown's decision to allow the cases to go forward for damages and have these three guys knock it out as something funny frivolous and vexatious. Okay, appellant's memorandum to three judges of the Federal Court of Appeal with respect to the restitution of the short-changed time off medical permits. Facts, part one. Since August 2017, more than 200 self-represented plaintiffs have filed virtually identical statements of claim in the Federal Court based on kits downloaded from the website of medical cannabis activist John Termel. I use those words from the Crown. Uh, seeking a declaration that the overlong processing time for registration to produce cannabis under the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations, ACMPR, violates the plaintiff's rights under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The claims also seek damages under Section 24 in the amount of the value of the applicant's prescription and lost site rent and expenses during any delay which this court may rule inappropriate. In addition, the claims also seek a declaration that the backdating of registration certificates pursuant to ACMPR Section 8 to be, the period of use begins on the day on which the medical document is signed by the practitioner, violates Section 7, so patients never get a full term, and in order that the plaintiff's registration certificates remain valid for the full period of time indicated in the medical document, pursuant to MMAR Section 33A, which said a personal use production license expires a 12 months after its date of issue, not the date the doctor signed, not backdated. Three, the claims are being collectively case managed by the Honorable Mr. Justice Brown by orders dated November 24th and December the 11th. Brown J. designated the action of Alan J. Harris with court file number T137917 as the lead action and ordered that the other actions be held in abeyance with no further proceedings permitted without leave of the court, pending final determination of the lead action. Four. On March 2nd, 2018, the Minister of Health issued a class exemption under Section 56 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which allegedly provided for the issuance of registration certificates with a period of use beginning on the date that the registration certificate is issued, the March 2 class exemption. You think we win. On April 27th, Canada filed a motion to strike the statement of claim in the lead action on the grounds that it did not disclose a reasonable cause of action and was frivolous and vexatious, and on the further grounds that the request for a declaration relating to the alleged backdating of registration certificates had been rendered moot by the March 2nd class exemption. Six, despite there being no mention of any exemption from Section 8 b in those orders, on page 7, exhibit, exhibit A of Canada's motion to strike, it was heralded as ending the backdating and starting the period on a date of issuance for all those registered after March the 2nd. 
Those registered before March the 2nd were to remain shortchanged by the backdating that was no longer being committed against new registrants. Seven, by order dated July 20th, the federal court granted Canada's motion in part. The court declined to strike the A portion of the claim concerning the long processing time for registration to produce cannabis for personal medical use, but struck the B portion of the claim concerning the restitution of the time subtracted from the period of use by the admitted backdating of registration certificates as too trivial for constitutional remedy, not mooted by such relief now being provided for those registered after March the 2nd ruling. Quote, paragraph 20, the plaintiff also seeks a declaration that backdating the period of registration and renewal from the effective date for registration or expiry date for renewals to the date the doctor signed the prescription under the ACMPR violates his Section 7 charter rights and claims full remedy for the full term of the prescription to take effect on the effective date of the registration and on the expiry date of the renewed registration. 25. Must be Judge Brown's decision. He states that the MMAR permits began on the effective date of issuance and renewed on the same date each year. In contrast, he states that the ACMPR permits and renewals are backdated to when the doctor signed the medical document, reducing the term of registration and renewal by the time to process the application. I note in this case his permit lasted only five or so months. We do not know when his medical document was signed. A year before expiry date. 26. He states that not only is over six months the key in the data unconscionable, but by short changing from the full term registration under the MMAR to a half term registration under the ACMPR, applicants or renewals always get less than the full term of medication prescribed by the measure of the unconscionable amount of time spent for processing. 27. The plaintiff says that the two one-year prescriptions should end up being 24 months of registration and asks the court to return the time shortchanged from patients' permits and renewals and prevent any further shortchanging. 28. The plaintiff says that having to see the doctor more often does cost the plaintiff more money and having to wait for the mail to find out if the registration was renewed before its expiry date when everything would have to be destroyed does cause the plaintiff more stress. C. Is the allegation of shortchanging moot having regard to subsequent changes? 48. On the facts pleaded in respect of the shortchanging issue, the plaintiff seeks a declaration that the dating of the permit back to the date that the medical document was signed to coincide with the time period for use stated by his health care practitioners, the alleged backdating of the permit, violates his Section 7 charter rights. 49. In response, the defendant's evidence is that on March the 2nd, the Minister of Health Canada issued several class exemptions pursuant to Section 56 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. These exemptions apply to anyone with a permit issued on or after March the 2nd, 2018. Pursuant to these exemptions, Health Canada now issues permits with a period of use that begins on the date the permit is issued instead of on the date that the medical document was signed by the health care practitioner. Looks like a win, right? This, says the defendant, is the very relief sought by the plaintiff. Yeah, stop it, but give us back our time. <laughs> relief having been granted by the minister, the defendant says that the requested declaration is now moot. I respectfully disagree. I agree that short-changing issue raised by this plaintiff is moot for permits dated after March the 2nd. However, on the facts of this case, the plaintiff's permit was dated well before that, on October the 11th, 2017. If the change in policy was made to apply to the plaintiff's permit, the defendant would be correct because the plaintiff's permit would have been valid until October the 10th. In that case, his claim would be moot in that respect. So they could have fixed it for everybody, but they wanted to fight and not give up that much. 53. However, the policy change was forward-looking only. As I see it, the plaintiff did not obtain the benefit of the change in policy because his permit was not issued on or after March the 2nd. Right? Therefore, mootness does not apply in the plaintiff's case.
and four. This is the judge's uh, decision that we're appealing, okay? That said, I have concluded that the short change submission should be struck because while I understand the plaintiff does not obtain a full year's worth of permit and must reapply sooner as a result, his loss does not support an allegation of breach of Section 7 charter rights. I do not see the resulting reduction in the term of the permit or document to infringe or deny a charter right. He simply experiences the vagaries of having to renew his permit earlier and not getting the benefit of the full term otherwise available. Hey, someone changed it to cut the terms and shortchange the people, you know. They should be punished. Such delays may commonly occur where one applies by mail for a time-limited permit or document from government, such as, for example, a passport or motor vehicle license. Even if a charter right was breached by a reduction in the term of the permit, which I do not accept. This court recently held in Johnson versus Canada, the charter does not protect against trivial limitations of rights. Such reduction, in my view, would be trivial. 55. In this respect, I revert to that part of the motion to strike based on no reasonable cause of action. I find it plain and obvious that the short-changing aspect of the plaintiff's claim discloses no reasonable cause of action. I see no need to allow an amendment in this respect as none could save this aspect of his pleading. In any event, this plaintiff has already been granted leave to amend twice, once on consent, but the second time on a contested motion. Therefore, paragraphs 1b, 8, and 9 of the amended statement of claim must be struck. 56. In the result, the motion to strike is dismissed, which is a crown motion, except as it relates to the short-changing allegation. 8. On August 20th, plaintiff appealed against the dismissal of the B claim for restitution to the time subtracted from the permit period of use. 9. After failing to file a statement of defense to the A claim by July the 20th, defendant then cross-appealed against the dismissal of the motion to strike the A claim over over long processing time to repeat its arguments above. So they didn't file an appeal on time. They weren't going to appeal. Then they missed their deadline for a statement of claim. And the only way to recoup was to now file a cross appeal and repeat everything above again. Points of issue. Not all permit shortchanging was mooted after March the 2nd. B. Damages not too trivial for remedy to be granted. And C. Remedy too trivial not to have been granted. So, A. Not all permit shortchanging was mooted by those 56 orders. They actually said nothing about changing the doctor date to the uh, issuance date at all. 10. After March the 2nd, 2018, renewed permits are still being backdated to before the original permit expires, thus continuing to reduce the total period of use. All renewals continue to lose some of their present prescriptions, not by backdating to when the doctor signed, but by backdating to the date of issuance of the renewal permit before expiry of the original. So patients get the full term in the renewed permit, but it overlaps the end of the original permit, providing unneeded double exemption. 11. In the case of Denise Baudouin, T1425, um, the doctor signed, column, permit issued, permit expires. So she applied September the 28th, permit was issued November the 30th, 2016, and the permit expires September 28th, 2017. So she loses a couple of months for the processing. The renewal sent in, the doctor signed it June 27th. The permit is issued September the 22nd, and it expires June 27th. So again, she loses from June to September, the overlap. And next year, renewal, April 18th, doctor signed. June the 4th, the permit is issued. Now it expires a year later because they say they changed the rules. 12. Upon her application, her permit was issued November the 30th, and she got until September the 28th, a year from the date the doctor signed. Only 10 months with two months short changed under Section 8, like all other applicants before March the 2nd. Yeah, it's a repeat. The same for her first renewal, which expired a year from when the doctor signed, losing her another three months. And her second renewal was after the March 2nd change from ACMPR, 
back to the old Section 33 date issued. Her permit was issued more than three weeks before her previous permit expired. So she shortchanged another three weeks. Had she sent in her renewal three months in advance and gotten it done in two weeks, the last two and a half months of her first permit would be lost by overlapping. So the short changing to the date the doctor signed under Section 8 may now be ended by the announced Section 56 class exemptions, but the short changing for renewals to the issuance date still goes on. So, damages not too trivial for remedy to be granted. Though delays in obtaining passports and vehicle licenses may cause trivial damage, delays in obtaining medication are not too trivial damage to engage Section 7 Charter Protection. Delay for your passport or motor vehicle license won't kill you, as delay for your prescription could. Also, passports and licenses do not cost thousands of dollars to obtain, as do medical permits. 14. Considering some patients may pay several thousand for a permit, it's not just going back more often that is costly, but losing the paid for permit time they did not receive. 15. The latest victim plaintiff, Steve Vetrachek, T1371, paid 2000 for his medical document and Health Canada didn't have its registration processed in nine months. Appellant Jeff Harris paid 2300 for a medical permit. Many people are paying in the hundreds, if not thousands, for medical documents when their own personal doctors have been intimidated away from participation with a dosage verification letter and harassing phone calls from Health Canada and provincial doctor associations. The financial loss suffered from the subtraction of almost half the term of use for a high-priced medical document is not too trivial a damage especially to 15,000 people, to warrant Section 7 protection from such inaction due to government short staffing. With over 15,000 patients, the value of the time lost must be in the millions of hours, days. C. Remedy too trivial not to have been granted. A remedy ordering the reissuance of 15,000 permits with updated expiry dates was too trivial not to have been granted. All they got to do is have the programmer count the dates that were subtracted and stick them on the next permit, right? The computer program could simply insert the proper expiry date after issuance or after expiry of the original permit with the previously subtracted time back in. A 15,000 permit print run and 15,000 stamps are all it would cost to remedy da damages for all those deprived before March the 2nd, 2018. Order sought. Appellant seeks an order that Health Canada make restitution of the time improperly subtracted from permits registered before March the 2nd, 2018, and a declaration that a renewed permit must have a permit of use from the date of expiry of the old permit, not from the date of issuance of the renewed permit. So, that's it. No authorities necessary. Signed by Jeff Harris, December 3rd, 2018, in Vancouver. And it's coming up in the Vancouver Courthouse. Much longer one. This is now our memorandum answering the Crown's arguments, their memorandum, to, to overrule Judge Brown letting our actions in for damages. All right, so they made their memorandum and now we're chopping it up. Part one, facts. Since August 2017, more than 200 self-represented plaintiffs for whom Alan J. Harris has been named lead plaintiff have filed virtually identical statements of claim in the federal court based on kits downloaded from the website of a medical cannabis activist, John Termel, seeking, one, a declaration that the bureaucratic short staffing caused by overlong delays for registrations to produce cannabis under the ACMPR compared to next day access from licensed producers violates the plaintiff's rights under section 7 of the Charter of Rights cause of action A and 2 that's for a declaration that that's bad 
Two, damages under Section 24 in the amount of the value of the applicant's prescription for cannabis not grown, determined by a formula such as price times grams per day times number of days equals dollars damages. Lost site rent and expenses during any delay, which this court may rule inappropriate. In addition, the claims also sought a declaration, the backdating, and I can skip that because we did it. Lead plaintiff Alan J. Harris submitted an initial application for registration to produce cannabis on June 11, 2017. After 13 weeks, he filed the present Termel Kit Statement of Claim on September the 11th. The registration was granted on October the 11th, 2017, and expired on March the 23rd, 5.5 months later. At a preliminary hearing, Mr. Justice Brown also ordered the defendant to explain the backdating of permits under Section 82B to shorten the period of exemption in any motion to strike as frivolous or vexatious compared to the old MMAR Section 33 that started the permit when issued. So he said, explain the backdating to me when you try and strike these things. On March the 2nd, Health Canada issued three class exemptions announcing the change of start of ACMPR 82B when the doctor signed back to MMAR 33A when the permit was issued. Supplementary Appeal Book Tab 1, 2, and 3 contains those three orders, um, uh, exemptions, that don't talk about the doctor dates changing at all. Pure scam. On, they just stopped doing it, but they didn't actually change the legislation. So, on June the 20th, Judge Brown ruled that the class exemptions announcing the change of period start date to stop the subtraction had mooted the action for the declaration that the subtraction violated rights. It was now fixed. The claims for restitution of the time subtracted were dismissed as too trivial a harm to warrant charter protection and as the subject of the originating appeal. But Judge Brown did dismiss the defendant's motion to strike the claims as frivolous and vexatious for having no reasonable cause of action due to insufficient facts, the subject of this defendant's cross appeal. In his June 20th order and reasons, Judge Brown writes, one, this is a motion by the defendant for an order striking the plaintiff's amended statement of claim, his action, which also may result in the court striking some 200 similar case managed actions now over 300. These actions are in most cases identical and are copied from a website on the internet. The motion is brought on the basis that it is plain and obvious that the claim fails to disclose a reasonable cause of action. And wink, wink. In addition, it is alleged that the plaintiff's action is frivolous and vexatious. Finally, in respect, yeah, people complaining about the delays, that's frivolous and vexatious. Finally, in respect of what I will refer to as short-changing pleadings, the defendant argues this issue is moot because of a regulatory or policy change. Because I'm not persuaded the defendant has established her case, the motion to strike must be dismissed. That's against the damages claims. There is no merit to the argument that the pleadings are frivolous and vexatious. The court must also reject the defendant's submission that the short-changing claim is moot. While for some it may be boot moot, for this plaintiff it is not. And of course, then he had to say too trivial as the way out, but not moot. The defendant's motion is brought pursuant to Rule 221-1A of the Federal Court Rules. Rule 221 permits the court to strike a claim on certain grounds. On motion, the court may at any time order that a pleading or anything contained therein be struck out with or without leave to amend on the ground that it A, discloses no reasonable cause of action or defense, as the case may be, or C, is scandalous, frivolous, or vexatious. Four, the action sought to be dismissed, stripped, stripped to its essentials, claims charter damages for alleged unconscionable delays in the processing time taken between the filing of an application for and obtaining a permit, allowing an applicant to grow marijuana for medical purposes. In addition, the claim alleges delays in the processing time taken between the filing and the application to renew such permit and when it is obtained. Eight, permits under the ACMPR are available to persons who demonstrate their need for cannabis marijuana to treat their medical conditions. Applications for these permits must be supported by a medical document from an authorized health care practitioner, basically a prescription. 
history and basis of right to medical marijuana. And the Crown didn't like this. 11. The right to possess and cultivate marijuana for medical purposes has been litigated in Canada for almost two decades, and I was there the whole time. A brief overview of this history is provided by Phelan J. of this court in Allard versus Canada, from which I take the following. This is a chartered challenge to the current mar medical marijuana regime under the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations, MMPR, brought by four individuals. It's important to hear, bear in mind what this litigation is about, and equally what it's not about. Two, this case is not about the legalization of marijuana generally, or the liberalization of its recreational lifestyle use, nor is it about the commercialization of marijuana for such purposes. Three, this case is about the access to marijuana for medical purposes by pe persons who are ill, including those suffering severe pain and or life-threatening neurological conditions. Such persons also encompass those in the very last stages of their life. Four, the judge said. This is another decision in a line of cases starting with R versus Parker and culminating in R versus Smith that have examined often with a critical eye the efforts of government to regulate the use of marijuana for medical purposes and the various barriers and impediments to accessing this necessary drug. Like other cases, this most recent attempt at restricting access founders on the shoals of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms being Schedule uh, Part 1 of the Constitution Act, Schedule B of the Canada Act, um, Section 7 particularly, and is not saved by Section 1. 1. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in the subject only to the reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So they can violate your rights, but they need a good reason. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Six, the court has concluded that the plaintiff's liberty and security interests are engaged by the access restrictions imposed by the MMPR, and that the access restrictions have not been proven to be in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So, 12, suffice to say, I think that was just failing. Now we're back to Brown. Suffice to say that the right to access marijuana and cannabis for medical purposes is guaranteed by the Charter, an undoubted legal matter having been decided by this court, the Supreme Court of Canada, and as well as by superior courts and provinces. In addition, the right of access to marijuana and other cannabis products for medical purposes is a right conferred upon individuals on application by the government council in subordinate legislation, regulations issued pursuant to the relevant legislation, law on motion to strike. The law in relation to motions to strike is set out below. 14. In Lee versus Canada, uh, da, 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 da. Hennigan J. stated the following in respect to the test for motions to strike. The test upon a motion to strike a pleading is set out in the decision in Hunt. That is, whether it is plain and obvious that the pleadings disclose no reasonable cause of action. According to the decision in Beatle Bay versus Canada, at paragraph 24, a claim must show the following three elements in order to disclose a reasonable call of that, cause of action. Allege facts that are capable of giving rise to a cause of action. Indicate the nature of the action, which is to be founded upon those facts, and indicate the relief sought, which must be a type that an action that can produce and that the court has jurisdiction to grant. 15. The moving party bears the onus of meeting the test set out in the Supreme Court of Canada in Hunt and Alamani versus Canada. For the amended statement of claim, Judge Brown writes, 19. The plaintiff's amended statement of claim is relatively straightforward. Factual allegations, as noted, are taken as proven. It starts with a claim for a declaration that the long processing time for ACMPR production permits, the plaintiff refers to the approval document as a registration, which technically it is, but I prefer to use the word permit, and renewals violates his Section 7 charter to right to life, liberty, and security. He further claims a remedy of damages under Section 24 in the amount of the value of his prescription during any delay which the court may rule inappropriate for a reasonable processing time. Oh, don't forget the rent, okay? And expenses, 34. Uh, that was in the amended version. 34, the issue is delay. The plaintiff says that delay violates 
It violated his charter rights under Section 7 to life, liberty, and security of the person. There's no doubt he has such rights, and that these include his right to access a production permit for medical marijuana. In a situation like this, I take it as a given that when the courts and the legislature, the governor and council in this case, declare rights and create administrative mechanisms to deliver them, those rights may not be denied through unreasonable delay. Rather, the converse, the executive government, in this case the Minister of Health, has a duty to act with reasonable dispatch, absent explanation otherwise, where rights have been declared by the courts, particularly charter rights. To argue otherwise may entail a less than respectful application of the law, including, of course, delivering upon charter protected rights. 36. It appears to me that the Minister of Health take the position that charter protected rights may be delayed unreasonably without legal consequence, although not expressed. This seems to underline the, petition, uh, the position advanced by the defendant. I do not make a ruling in this connection but I am not persuaded that the plaintiff has no chance to show that such a position is untenable. I am not persuaded, paragraph 37, it is plain and obvious that the plaintiff's pleadings disclose no reasonable cause of action on the facts presumed to be true in this case. Put another way, I've concluded there is a chance the plaintiff may succeed in his case. 38. I appreciate there are many related claims being case managed relating to this action. I am the case management judge, have reviewed each, and have issued a large number of orders dealing with interim and other relief. While I have stayed all interim interlocutory proceedings in the related cases, I have lifted the stay where a motion alleges a delay in the issuance of a permit of more than 60 days and invited the Crown to respond. That said, the argument that there are many related claims does not assist defendants. Rather, it underscores the importance of the duty lying upon the Minister of Health to establish administrative mechanisms that deliver on charter protected rights determined not only by the Governor and Council in the ACMPRs, but by the Supreme Court of Canada. 39. In this connection, the Court keeps in mind that the plaintiff has a medical condition and a prescription for marijuana to treat his medical condition. It may be found that the Minister of Health may not unreasonably delay issuing permits to the plaintiff in his circumstances, if that is in fact his or her position. The plaintiff wishes to grow his own marijuana, which with a permit in hand, he is entitled to do. But he cannot do that until he has the permit or renewal. 40. And if he needs a, to renew a production permit, and the renewal application is unreasonably delayed, with the result his original permit expires, everything, quote, everything would have to be destroyed, as he claims. Otherwise, he would be subject to fine and imprisonment for the possession of unused plants and stored marijuana grown previously. As to the stress referred to in the pleadings, this is also a matter for evidence. The plaintiff may or may not succeed. That will be determined by the evidence. The defendant has not established this plain and obvious that this claim should be struck. 42. Nothing in what is stated above should be taken as determining whether the plaintiff will succeed or fail in his action. I make no finding on whether there is a cause of action for unreasonable delay, or if so, what constitutes unreasonable delay. It may be that a delay of four months in processing the plaintiff's permit application was reasonable. The point of today's ruling is that the plaintiff has a chance of succeeding in his claim. However, it may be that the delay in the plaintiff's case was reasonable. In that case, the defendant will succeed. 43. In terms of damages, I'm not persuaded it is plain and obvious that no damages would be awarded if the plaintiff establishes his charter-protected rights were infringed or denied, contrary to sections, subsection 24 of the Charter. It's well established, again by the Supreme Court of Canada, the charter breaches may be remedied under Section 24.1 by an award of monetary damages. See, for example, Vancouver City versus Ward. 44. In this respect, the court is performing a gatekeeping function. The onus was on the defendant, and in my respectful view, she failed to meet the test. It is not plain and obvious that these pleadings disclose no reasonable cause of action. B. Is the action frivolous or vexatious? 
The court has determined that it is not plain and obvious that this action discloses no reasonable cause of action. The essence of the defendant's submission that the action is frivolous and vexatious is that the plaintiff's claims are so lacking in material facts and unintelligible that it is frivolous and vexatious. The argument in this respect is contained in a single paragraph in the defendant's memorandum of fact and law. The defendant only states that the action should be struck as frivolous and vexatious. In my respectful view, there is insufficient merit in that submission to warrant its further consideration. And they're appealing. So, the motion to strike the amended statement of claim is dismissed in part, no order as to costs. Seven now, Canada failed my memorandum, our memorandum. Canada failed to file an appeal against the dismissal within 30 days. Canada fell into default of filing the required statement of defense within 30 days. Alan Harris did appeal within 30 days that losing months subtracted off the permits of 15,000 patients that can cost over 2,000 bucks and could easily be added back isn't too trivial a remedy to be granted. 10. The defendant further avoids adjudication of those claims of damages from unconscionable short staffing delays for which Canada has failed to file a statement of defense. I now cross appealing on grounds that were not originally worthy of being appealed directly within 30 days. 27. The issue on Canada's cross appeal is whether the motions judge erred in failing to strike the claim concerning the registration processing time. The issue on the plaintiff's appeal is whether the motions judge erred in striking the claim concerning the period of registration. All right, so they laid out the difference between theirs and ours. Issues, part two. 11. The Crown in the Harris Appeal for Damages Claims argues, 1. It's plain and obvious, again, back to what they told the judge, it's plain and obvious this claim fails to disclose a reasonable cause of action. The claim alleges that the processing time for registration to personally produce cannabis violates Section 7. However, it contains no material facts to show that the processing time for registration deprived the plaintiff of life, liberty, or security of the person, and that the processing time in his case was inconsistent with the principles of fundamental justice. We had good reason to do it. 29. The motion's judge made three errors of law in failing to strike the claim concerning the registration processing time for personal and designated production. First, he erred in finding that the Canadian courts have recognized a constitutional right to produce cannabis for medical purposes. After all that the judge read out about past laws that you have a right to cannabis, they're still saying he's wrong. Second, he failed to consider whether the amended claim contained material facts to demonstrate a violation of Section 7. Well, he, yes, he did. He actually listed off the facts. Third, he failed to consider whether the claim disclosed facts to warrant charter damages. Alternately, if he considered the second and third issues, the motions judge made palpable and overriding errors of fact and inexplicably mixed fact and law in concluding that the facts pleaded were sufficient. Not enough to point out how much time the period was and how much was missing. <laughs> Need to know more. Our submissions. Right to grow. One, Canada argues no constitutional right to produce. Forty, that's probably what the judge said. In stating that the court, oh, that's right. In stating that the courts have confirmed a right for patients to produce cannabis, the motions judge <coughs> appears to have relied on the Supreme Court in Smith and the federal court in Allard. However, neither case recognizes a constitutional right for patients to produce cannabis. Well, Allard does. Thirteen. Maybe those courts do not, oh, we're answering, do not so clearly recognize a constitutional right for patients to produce cannabis. But the new cannabis regulations does say the minister must register an applicant who met the requirements. Registration with minister under the cannabis regulations, 313.1. If the requirements set out in section 312 are met, the minister must, subject to the section 317, probably rules, why not? Register the applicant and issue them a registration certificate. Must. If the minister must register the qualified applicant, 
then the qualified applicant has a right to what the minister must do. It's persuasive that the Allard and Smith courts interpret must in the same way. Insufficient facts to establish violation. Canada argues, paragraph 45 in their memorandum, having incorrectly held that the plaintiff had a constitutional right to produce cannabis, the motions judge proceeded to consider whether the amended claim contained facts to show that the processing time for in initial registration to produce cannabis was unreasonable. Nine months, 11 months, you know. The motions judge failed to consider the correct question, which was whether the claim disclosed material facts to show a deprivation of the plaintiff's life, liberty, and security of the person that was inconsistent with the principles of fundamental justice. Now, we didn't need to show it all again because other cases have said that when you deny people medicine, that's a violation of their rights. So he wants us to prove how much they've been hurt again, even though it's already been established, no man's hurt. 16. Brown J. spends paragraphs 16 to 18 explaining the need for sufficient facts, and then spends paragraphs 19 to 28 laying out many facts which were taken as proven. Fact 1. In paragraph 19, cl we claim long processing time violates section 7. Fact two, damages are the value lost during undue delay. Fact three, plaintiff has a medical document. Fact four, the date submitted, June the 11th. Fact five, the date processed, October the 11th. Fact six, the date it expired, March 23, 2018. Fact seven, MMAR time less than four weeks. Fact eight, ACMPR time took over 30 weeks. Fact 9, only 10 data fields to process. Fact 10, MMAR renewed on the date of the regional issuance. Fact 11, ACMPR backdating to the date the doctor signed. Fact 12, period of exemption is thus reduced. You can do subtraction. Fact 13, Harris permit lasted only five months and or so. And fact 14, Paragraph 26, claim over six months to process is unconscionable. And fact 15, the claim shortchanging gets less than a full term. Yeah. And fact 16, wants restitution of time on the next permit. And fact 17, seeing doctors more often costs more often. And fact 18, looming expiry waiting for renewal causes stress. The Crown alleges speculation, bald allegations dressed up as facts. B, the principles on a motion to strike, 32 they say. The test on a motion to strike for no reasonable cause of action is whether it's plain and obvious that the claim does not disclose a reasonable cause of action. A claim discloses a reasonable cause of action if it contains facts capable of supporting each element. The requirement to plead facts is in support of each element is supplemented in the federal court rules which mandate that parties plead all material facts on which they rely on particulars of every allegation. Now, I've listed 18 facts the judge could figure out. While courts must generally accept the facts pleaded as true for the purpose of the motion to strike, which he did, they are not required to accept speculation. What speculation? Bald allegations, name one, or conclusory statements of law dressed up as facts. Go ahead. Plaintiffs are also not permitted to make broad allegations in hopes of later discovering facts to support them or to file inadequate pleadings and rely on the defendant to request particulars. 18. The cross appellant fails to indicate, we're saying, which facts Judge Brown had taken as proven were speculation, bald allegations, or conclusory statements of law dressed up as facts but only makes the bald assertion <laughs> that the judge had taken speculation, bald allegations, and conclusory statements of law dressed up as proven facts without citing one example. Ooh, sleazy, eh? So, 19. Some facts the Crown does admit. 19. The amended claim alleges that the plaintiff is medically authorized to use cannabis. 1. That he applied June 11th. Who, for registration, it alleges it was granted October the 11th, third fact, and was scheduled to expire March 23rd, fourth fact, about the period. The claim also 
alleges that the processing time is up to 30 weeks for some patients. Hey, nine months is 39. And one guy was 11 months. So for some patients, and that the processing time for a personal or designated production license under the former MMAR was much shorter. 20. The amended claim alleges that the plaintiff experienced stress due to the prospect of having to renew his registration before an existing registration expired. Everybody did. All those people who made motions and the judge grant lifted to stay to hear them, and then Canada, Health Canada hopped to get it to them on time. Um, so the amended claim seeks declaration unspecified damages in the amount of the value of the applicant's prescription during any delay which this court may rule inappropriate. See, other claims. The plaintiff's claim is based on a kit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now there are more than 250 who filed. Like the plaintiff's claim, the other claims allege that the plaintiffs are medically authorized to use cannabis and have applied to Health Canada for registration or designated production. In cases where Health Canada has granted the application, the claims indicate the date of registration and when it will expire. A lot of facts, right? So, our point, 20 now. All plaintiffs submitted those same main facts on Judge Brown's list to establish that there were long processing delays. Not facts that the delays for medication violate rights. Shaouli versus Quebec established that medication delays violated rights. Should not have to show evidence that delays harm again. Delays do harm. Proving delays in due treatment proves that harm. 21. Facts that Canada has said are needed. 22. The claims are otherwise boilerplate and contain virtually no details concerning each plaintiff's circumstances or how they were personally affected by the registration processing time or period of registration. 22. The Crown had told the court they needed to know what medical doc condition. It's not a fact Judge Brown needed to know to adjudicate whether the time for processing was unconscionably long. Why he doesn't choose other medication available is not a fact Judge Brown needed to know to adjudicate whether the time for processing was unconscionably long. And why he chooses to grow rather than purchase is not a fact Judge Brown needed to know to adjudicate whether the time for processing was unconscionably long. 23. The facts the defendant says are missing to make the case are not facts Judge Brown needed to know to adjudicate whether the time for processing was unconscionably long. Knowing only the start and expiry dates of the permit, the judge did not need to know any of these other facts defendant argues are missing. The facts identified as lacking by the defendant were not deemed relevant facts by the judge. Why would he need to know what illness the patient was suffering while waiting nine months for his permit? or why he prefers herbals over chemicals, or why he isn't buying from an LP. Shaouli, delay violates right. 24. The only facts needed and proffered were to prove the delay. Shaouli versus Quebec had the material facts establishing that delays in receiving medication deprived the plaintiff of life, liberty, or security of the person. The processing time in plaintiff's case was inconsistent with the principles of fundamental justice and that the short staffing bureaucratic delays unconscionably shortened the periods of use. Three, facts for damages. Shaouli also found damages appropriate. Brown J said there was a hope here too. Damages for delays in obtaining medication by screw-ups in government bureaucracy was sought and not deemed inappropriate. This isn't damages over bad legislation, it's damages over bad administration. No need to show malice, just incompetence. 26. The value of the damages can be tabulated. Computed, better word. Rent and fixed expenses and the value of the product that should have been grown during the unconscionable delay. The damages can be evaluated. 27. Crown says claim concerning renewal is now moot. 56. While the motions judge failed to address life, liberty, and security of the person as they relate to the plaintiff's application for initial registration, he did rely on the possibility that Health Canada might fail to renew his registration in a timely manner and that the plaintiff would have to destroy his existing cannabis plants. This was improper speculation and the current regulations have rendered this concern moot. Crown saying that, okay, 
So, 57. Although the facts pleaded are generally assumed to be true in the motion to strike, a claim cannot rest on speculation or allegations about hypothetical future events that the law says you've got to do. <laughs> if your thing expires, you've got to destroy your plantation. The amended claim notes, you've got to show, anyway. The amended claim notes that the plaintiff would have to destroy his cannabis plants if Health Canada ever failed to renew his registration before his existing registration expired. This is purely speculative. If his thing expires, he won't have to destroy his plants necessarily. As the claim does not allege that Health Canada has ever actually failed to renew his registration or that the plaintiff has ever actually had to destroy his cannabis plants. Others have. This prospect has also been rendered moot since the motion's decision. Unlike the former ACMPR, the current regulations provide that patients who submit a renewal application prior to the expiry of their existing registration may continue to produce cannabis in according with their existing registration until such time as the renewal application is granted or refused. Big win for us. It stopped our people making motions going, ah, I'm expiring tonight. Do something, Your Honor. This is a complete answer to the concern raised in the amended claim. To the extent that it relies on this concern, the claim is now moot, and there's no reason to hear the claim in spite of its mootness. So, because he didn't actually um, hit the expiry date, oh, he's got no reason to call it a fact that he would have to. It is The fact he has to is a fact. It is a complete answer for the future, but does not remedy the damages from the past. Those orders. Robert Dylan McGammon, T1375, Terry Johns Guard, T13418, Heidi Chartrand, T14418, and Kent Truman, T4849, 18, had their permit expire and suffered that legal compulsion to destroy all they had worked for. Judge Brown took it as proven that waiting for renewal, given the threats of expiry, did cause stress. Dozens more had their hearings mooted by completion of the process and delivery of the appeal, but good that it's been stopped. <clears throat> 29. The Crown has argued reviewing takes time. 69. The amount of statement claim alleges that Health Canada is merely required to process only 10 data fields, and that over six months the key in the data is unconscionable. This is a clear mischaracterization of the registration process, which involves thoroughly reviewing applications and verifying their contents for compliance with the highly detailed regulations. Name, address, phone number. Wow! 30. Reviewing that same information used to take four weeks under the MMAR, but worse under the ACMPR took nine months with a statement of claim to open the application and tell Steve Vetracek that he'd missed filling a box. Nine months. Sat there with no box. And then they finally open it and say, after he files a claim, and say, oh, you missed a box. After nine months. He's got eight months claim. It wasn't the review that took nine months. It was the initial inspection after nine months that indicates a real short staffing problem. 31. Finally, Canada argues the claim also alleges the processing times for production license under the former MMAR was shorter. 32. Judge Brown accepted as proven as fact the MMAR took under four weeks, not the vague much shorter. Order sought. Appellant seeks an order dismissing the cross appeal and letting the actions be heard below. So, in production... Okay, coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. 